Welcome to a live BYU devotional broadcast. Today, Laureen Alfin of the BYU College of Life Sciences will address the campus community. The devotional originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our campus devotional. Today we will have the opportunity of hearing from Lorene Alfen Flinders, Associate Dean in the College of Life Sciences. We welcome her husband, Steve, who is seated next to her, as well as their family members and friends who have joined us today. Please join us next Tuesday at this same time and place for another campus devotional when we will have the privilege of hearing from Elder Garrett W. Gong, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We hope you will attend. This morning's prelude was provided by Samantha Kime, a junior studying organ performance from Hillsboro, Oregon, Rebecca Eldridge, a junior choral music education major from Mesa, Arizona, led us in the opening hymn. The invocation this morning will be offered by Ransom Alfen, a senior majoring in information systems from Reed Spring, Missouri, and a nephew of Sister and Brother Flinders. Immediately following the opening prayer, Casey Hyatt, a senior majoring in vocal performance from Highland, Utah, will perform a vocal solo entitled, Where Can I Turn for Peace?, with Brooke Ballard, a senior studying piano performance from Riverton, Utah, on the piano. Now the prayer by Brother Alton. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day and we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here together and hear some inspired words. And please bless that we will all be safe as we travel um, to our homes and back to classes uh, today and in the weather. And please bless that we will all uh, feel thy spirit and continue to learn uh, here at BYU and learn from thee and these things you say in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Cassie and Brooke, for that beautiful and inspirational music. Today, we are pleased to hear from Lorreen Alfin Flinders. Professor Alfin Flinders received both a bachelor's and a master's degree from BYU prior to attending the University of Utah, where she received her PhD in biology. She was hired by BYU in 1996, directly after obtaining her PhD, and is a faculty member in the Department of Plant and Wildlife Sciences. Dr. Alfin Flinders currently serves as, a, as Associate Dean in the College of Life Sciences. Sister Alfin Flinders enjoys horseback riding and hiking in the backcountry. She currently serves as an adult Sunday school teacher in her, her home ward. Sister Alfin Flinders and her husband, Steve, are the parents of six children, and they have four grandchildren. Following Sister Alfin Flinders' remarks, the benediction will be offered by Sierra Alfin, a junior wildlife and wildland conservation major from Mesa, Arizona. And now we'll be pleased to hear from Lorene Alfin Flinders. Thank you for that kind introduction and for that beautiful musical number. I am truly humbled to be asked to speak with you today, and I pray you will feel the spirit as I share my message and my testimony with you. We were all spiritually fed this past weekend with General Conference, and I hope you have room in your hearts for my message today. As was said in my introduction, I am a faculty member here at BYU, and I've been here for over 20, almost 27 years. I did both that bachelor's and a master's at BYU. I'm pictured here with my master's advisor, doc, the late Dr. Kimball T. Harper, before I went on to the University of Utah for that PhD. Like was said, BYU hired, direct, hired me directly after my PhD and I've been on the faculty ever since. So if you think about it, I have spent the greatest number of years of my life on campus here at BYU. For my academic research, I study the ecology and conservation of rare and endangered plant species. During my almost three decades as a professor, I have had the opportunity to study a wide variety of plant species in many diverse and beautiful places around the world. Those who know me know that I have a deep love for Heavenly Father's creations. I gained my love for the natural world as a young girl. The summers of my childhood were spent camping in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming with my immediate family and my grandparents. My mother and grandmother love wildflowers, and you can see them here. On our drives up the mountain, we would regularly stop the vehicles so that mom and grandma could jump out and try to identify any new wildflowers that they would see. From them, I learned to appreciate the beauty and the diversity of Heavenly Father's creations. Even today, to my children's chagrin, I have to stop the vehicle to identify any new plants that I see. I married my eternal companion, Steve Flinders, a, U, a, a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Um, Forest Service eight years ago, and together we have six children and four grandchildren. 
all of our children and grandchildren love the outdoors and enjoy spending time in nature. My love and appreciation for the natural world has continued to increase over my life. I find that I often feel closest to my Heavenly Father and my Savior when I'm out in the natural world. My research takes me to the field with my students, some of them seen here, to study the ecology of rare plants. Sometimes, as I am tediously working and taking measurements on plants, I forget to look up. I am focused on the task in front of me, and I forget to look up and take the bigger picture, take in the bigger picture, that bigger view. Elder Rafael E. Pino in April 2015 General Conference said these important words. Perspective is the way we see things when we look at them from a certain distance, and it allows us to appreciate their true value. It's like being in a forest and having a tree right in front of us. Unless we step back a little, we will not be able to appreciate what the forest really is, end quote. When I stop to look up, I gain perspective, and I realize that I am just a small part of this miraculous creation. As I look up, I am in awe of this beautiful world, as the primary song says, Heavenly Father created for me. This coming Sunday is Easter. Around Easter, we often sing one of my favorite hymns, All Creatures of Our God and King. Verse 4 of this hymn reads, Dear Mother Earth, who day by day unfoldest blessings on our way, the flowers and fruits that in thee grow, let them his glory also show. One of the divine purposes of the divine creation is to testify and witness of him, to let his glory also show. In Psalms 19.1, we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We read further in Alma 30.44, The scriptures are laid before thee, yea, and all things denote there is a God, yea, even the earth and all of the things that are upon the face of it. Yea, it's, its motion, yea, and also the planets which move in their regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator. Sister Susan Warner in October's 1998 General Conference explained it this way, because our Heavenly Father wants us to know Him and feel His love, He planned a world filled with magnificent creations that bear record of Him and His Son, Jesus Christ. Have you ever counted all the things that bear record of the Savior? There are sunsets and seashells, lilacs and lakes, insects and animals, miraculous mornings and star-strewn skies." End quote. President Russell M. Nelson clearly taught, the creation itself testifies of a creator. We cannot disregard the divine in the creation. Without our grateful awareness of God's hand in the creation, we would be just as oblivious as our, to our provider as our goldfish swimming in a bowl. With deep gratitude, we echo the words of the psalmist who said, O oh Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches." Close quote. About nine to ten years ago, I went through a very traumatic event in my life. Around the same time, I also went through a divorce. During this time, I was beset by stress and anxiety. My physical body rebelled against the trauma. I had trouble eating and sleeping. I was plagued by nightmares. I developed recurring shingles, a remnant of the chickenpox virus I had had as a child. My immune system was compromised, and I caught every illness that was being passed around. Where could I turn for peace amid this, amidst the storm of pain and turmoil, turmoil in my life? During this time, I found peace and refuge for my storm in two very sacred places, one out in the natural world and two in the Lord's holy temple. Thus desperately seeking that peace, I spent a lot of time in both of those places. One of my favorite childhood movies is The Sound of Music. 
In that movie, the star Maria receives words of wisdom from the mother abbess at the convent and who paraphrases the prophetic words from Psalms. She said, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Today, I would like to share with you some lessons that I learned from Heavenly Father's creations that helped me weather this storm from the traumatic event in my life. As I lifted my eyes unto the hills, I gained a more eternal perspective from the natural world. Elder Pino said in that 2015 conference, the eternal perspective of the gospel leads us to understand the place that we occupy in God's plan to accept difficulties and progress through them, to make decisions and center our lives on our divine potential, close quote. I learned how to accept this difficulty in my life and progress through it. I was able to better center my life on my divine potential. I attribute my progress to six important lessons that I learned from the natural world that I love and that I, that I study. So the first lesson from nature is grow toward the light. Plants exhibit phototropism. Tropism means growth toward, and photo means light. Have you ever noticed a plant growing toward the window in your house? Have you ever seen a plant growing up and around a rock to acquire more light? Plants grow toward light. Why? Light is essential for photosynthesis, which produces carbohydrates from carbon dioxide. These carbohydrates are necessary for plant growth, but are also the basis of the food chains and food webs for all other life on Earth. Without the carbon fixed from light energy, there would not be energy for further life in the ecosystem. Just as light is essential for life in the natural world, the light of Christ is necessary for our spiritual survival. Examples from the plant world have shown me how to actively grow toward the light of the world. In DNC 93.2, it reads, and that I am the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Sister Susan Warner in that same October 1998 conference said, wherever we live in this world, we see the glorious rising sun which bears record of the light of Christ that fills our hearts and enlightens our mind. Growing toward the Savior, focusing on Him, made all the difference during my time of struggle. I focused on His light. I grew toward it. How did I do it? I made a choice to keep my focus on the Savior every day. I consciously chose to look up to grow away from the sadness and darkness in my life and bathe in the warmth of the Savior's light. President Henry B. Eyring in April 2008 General Conference added insight. He says, when you walk in the light, you will feel at that moment some of the warmth and happiness that will finally be yours when you're welcomed home again. As I chose to grow toward the Savior, His light, I felt His warmth and love. I learned how to use the atonement more fully in my life, and I felt him carry my burdens and sorrows. I gained a broader perspective of the eternities and how to look forward with hope for the time, as Elder Iring said, when I might be welcomed home. The second lesson I learned from the natural world is remain deeply rooted in living waters. Water is also essential for photosynthesis. Plants use light energy to split a water molecule, which provides the molecular energy necessary to fix that carbon dioxide into the carbohydrate that the plant can then use for growth and survival. Because it is so important and so essential, many plant species have great adaptations for uptaking uh, water and preventing water loss, especially in our deserts. One strategy is to root deeply. This allows the plant to gain life-sustaining water from those deep reservoirs in the soil that don't easily evaporate. Deep roots also function as an anchor for the plant against storms and strong winds. During this traumatic and challenging time in my life, I went on a horse ride in the mountains. 
and I saw a tree uprooted from a storm. The tree roots were not deep and firm enough to withstand the strong winds. Another symbol of the Savior besides light is living water. As I looked at this uprooted tree, I asked myself, was I deeply rooted and anchored in living waters? From the story of Jesus and the woman at the well in John 4, 13 and 14, we read, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give them shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him uh, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting light. Just as plants have many strategies for uptaking and maintaining water, how much effort do we put into obtaining living water? What are some of the strategies that we can use to remain deeply rooted in living water? One way is to keep the commandments. In DNC 6323, it reads, But unto him that keepeth my commandments, I will give the mysteries of my kingdom, and the same shall be in him, a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. Elder Joseph B. Worthlin, in April 1995 conference said, By living the gospel of Jesus Christ, we develop within ourselves a living spring that will quench eternally our thirst for happiness, peace, and everlasting life. An additional way to remain deeply rooted is to make and keep sacred covenants. I made a choice to keep my sacred covenants and renew my covenants each week by partaking of the sacrament. President Russell M. Nelson said in last October's Liahona, our covenants will lead us closer and closer to him. God will not abandon his relationship with those who have forged such a bond with him. Close quote. Making and keeping covenants allows the love of the Savior to seek more deeply into our heart. Attendance at the temple was yet another thing that helped me remain deeply rooted. I made a specific choice to attend the temple at least once per week. I often went during my lunch break. Sometimes I would sit in the celestial room and stare at a picture of the Savior. Not only did I find peace there, but it helped me remain deeply rooted in that living water. Sometimes I found myself clinging onto the iron rod for dear life, partaking freely of living water. I am thankful that over my life I had developed a deeply rooted testimony of my Savior, His living water, for it sustained me during that difficult time. The third lesson I learned from nature is find effective ways to tolerate stress. A few years ago, I published a paper with my husband and one of his U.S. Forest Service colleagues on a new population of Great Basin bristlecone pine called Pinus longeva that we discovered in a unique place in the Tusher Mountains of southern Utah. The bristlecone pine falls into a category of species that we call stress tolerators, plants that live with the highest amounts of stress. And bristlecones are the ultimate stress tolerators. They grow just below tree line in a few of the mountainous regions of California, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. These trees thrive on adversity by living at high elevations where little else survives. Bristle cones are often called extremophiles by scientists. They survive extremely cold temperatures, extremely dry soils, high winds, and short growing seasons. These pines are also extremely long-lived. They are prehistoric. Many of the trees in our newly discovered population ranged from 1,000 to 1,500 years of age. Nevada has populations with trees that are living and they're over 3,000 years old. The two oldest known bristlecone pines are found in California and are 4,850 and 5,060 years of age, respectively. Just think about that for a moment. Those individual trees were there before the Savior walked the earth and are still living today. And these trees have fought those extreme elements for millennia. 
As Elder Uchtdorf in October 2010 General Conference says, one of the things we learned from studying the growth of trees is that during seasons, when conditions are ideal, trees grow at a normal rate. However, during seasons when growing conditions are not ideal, they slow down their growth and devote their energy to the basic elements necessary for survival. So how do bristle cones survive such extreme environmental conditions? They do this by doing just what Uchtdorf said. They grow slowly, devoting their energy to the simple basics for survival. Notice how tight the rings are on this cross section of a trunk of bristlecone pine. Most are less than one millimeter wide. They grow so little each year, okay, that you can't even see the growth rings without a microscope. This particular trunk is from a tree that lived about to about the age of 2,000 years old. Bristle cones do very little else but survive. I learned some important lessons on how to survive my experience from these pines. Elder L. Tom Perry in October 2008 General Conference suggested, in our search to obtain relief from the stresses of life, may we earnestly seek ways to simplify our lives. We can't predict all the struggles and all the storms that of, in life, not even the ones just around the next corner. But as persons of faith and hope, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true and the best is yet to come. Elder Uchtdorf in October 2010 further noted, if life and its rushed pace and many stresses have made it difficult for you to feel like rejoicing, then perhaps now is a good time to refocus on what matters most. We learn over and over again the importance of four key relationships with our God, with our families, with our fellow men, and with ourselves. Let us simplify our lives a little. Let us make changes necessary to refocus our lives on the sublime beauty of the simple, humble path of Christian discipleship, the path that leads toward a life of meaning, gladness, and peace." Close quote. During my stressful time, I learned from bristlecones that I had to simplify my life. I had to concentrate on what mattered most, the basics. I focused on my relationship with God and my children first. I focused on what was most important, personal scripture study, personal prayer, family prayer, and family home evening. And I let the less important things slide. I did only the basic things. I found I had no energy for anything more than that. I just survived. And doing this was hard for me, because those of you who know me know that I'm someone who likes to do everything for everyone. However, as I focused on what was most important and I simplified my life, I drew closer to my Savior, which helped me during this stressful time, and I was able to tolerate my stress. The next lesson I learned is that we don't need to know all the answers. Ecologists realize that ecosystems are incredibly complex. The more I study plant communities, the more I realize that we do not fully understand them. I have learned that there is no way to truly comprehend all the complex interrelationships between species and between species and the environment. Sometimes I make hypotheses about plants and their ecological communities, but I find later through data collection and study that I'm completely wrong in my assumptions. During this traumatic event, I ask a lot of questions about why. Why did I have to experience my trauma? Why did life have to be so hard? I did not have the answers. Elder Neil L. Anderson in October 2008 General Conference provided insight. He said, when we then remain steady and patient as we progress through mortality, at times the Lord's answer will be, you don't know everything, but you know enough, enough to keep the commandments and do what is right. Not knowing everything about a particular plant species, its ecology, or its role in the ecosystem has been okay for my research program. As I spent time in the natural world, I realized that it must also be okay 
that I do not have all the answers to the questions of why in my personal life. I relied heavily on my favorite scripture in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Further insight is given in DNC 90, 24. Search diligently, pray always, and be believing and all things shall work together for your good. If you walk uprightly and remember the covenant wherewith ye have covenanted one with another. Realizing that I did not need to know all helped me find peace. I could believe that all things would work together for my good if I walked uprightly and kept my covenants. In the plant world, seeds often need to be scarified before they can germinate and grow into a beautiful plant. Simply put, scarification is the breakdown of the hard seed coat so that water can enter. Scarification can be done through um, a variety of things, digestive tracts of animals, wind, freeze-thaw cycles, maybe mechanically bouncing off of rocks, and so forth. Maybe I needed to go through this trauma to be scarified a bit so that the living water could enter. Regardless, I knew enough, and that knowledge sustained me. As Elder Uchtdorf said in October 2013 conference, Sometimes questions arise because we simply don't have all the information and we just need a bit more patience. I testify that I have been blessed as I have learned to be patient in my prayers for answers, both in my ecological research and in my personal life. The fifth lesson I learned was to find refuge and stability in a diverse community. In ecology, we have a theory known as the diversity stability hypothesis. Basically, this theory states that more diverse communities in the number of different plant species they have maintain a more stable ecosystem function over periods of environmental stress, such as drought. Conceptually, it suggests that some species might be better adapted than other species to withstand specific types of disturbances. And thus the community or ecosystem retains its function in spite of the stress. Elder Peter Johnson said in last his fall devotional, the Lord loves diversity. I have come to learn the importance of a diverse community in the gospel. During my difficult time, I was surprised by the diversity of help that came to my rescue. It came from a wide variety of people and places. A former college roommate living in California provided support. A former bandmate from a country band who lived in South Dakota flew out to be there for me. A retired neighbor stepped up to help me with my children when I needed her. Former graduate student called during this time and provided collaboration and research help. My bishop dropped by my house unexpectedly and offered a blessing and there were many, many more. These people were from diverse socioeconomic positions, diverse educational levels, diverse cultural backgrounds, and even their relationships with me were from diverse aspects of my life. However, each brought their own unique perspective. Elder Uchtdorf in October 2013 said, brothers and sisters, dear friends, we need your unique talents and perspectives. The diversity of persons and pe per peoples all around the globe is the strength of this church. Elder Sam Wong in October 2014 General Conference said, in order to assist the Savior, we have to work together in unity and in harmony. Everyone, every position, and every calling is important. We have to be united in our Lord Jesus Christ. I am thankful that I had built a diverse community around me. My community had a diversity of talents, abilities, approaches. Each found their own unique way to help me. Some were better able to get through to me at different times than others. However, just like the diverse ecological community, my community came to my aid and provided me stability and refuge amidst my storm. They were able to work in unity and harmony for my rescue. The final lesson I learned from nature 
was always remember to thank him. As I spent time in the natural world during my struggle, I asked myself, do I look up in praise of him with the other creations? When my daughter Sabrina was four years old, she had terrible growing pains in her legs. I too was plagued by growing pains as a young girl, as my mother can attest to. It was very late one evening and way past Sabrina's bedtime. I was exhausted because she would not stop crying. When the pain medicine did not work, I told her that we needed to pray and ask Heavenly Father to take away her pain. We knelt down together and I offered a simple prayer that her pain would subside and that she would be able to sleep. I put Sabrina in bed next to me and I rubbed her legs until both of us fell asleep. In the morning, I was awakened by squeals of delight from Sabrina. She said, Mom, my legs don't hurt anymore. But what she did next melted my heart. She immediately looked up toward heaven and said, Thank you, Father. In D&C 7819, it reads, And he who receiveth all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious, and the things of this earth shall be added unto him, even a hundredfold, yea, more. Do we remember to thank him? Do we look up and say, thank you, Father? For me, it is sometimes a challenge to remember to do this in times of hardship. And it was particularly difficult during my traumatic event. Nephi was a notable example of someone who praised the Lord during his trials and afflictions. In 1 Nephi 18, 16, we read, Nevertheless, I did look unto my God, and I did praise him all day long. And I did not murmur against the Lord because of mine afflictions. President David O. McKay once stated, We find in the bitter chill of adversity the real test of our gratitude, which goes beneath the surface of life, whether sad or joyous. My traumatic event was a real test of my gratitude. As Elder uh, Moises Villanueva in October 2021 General Conference said, my dear brothers and sisters, how do we react to our afflictions? Do we murmur before the Lord because of them? Or like Nephi, do we feel thankful in word, thought, and deed because we are more focused on our blessings than our problems? Just like the Lord's creations and Nephi, I tried to praise him all day long. I made a conscious choice to actively look for things each day to be grateful for. For me, maybe it was just a beautiful sunset, good weather for my commute. My kids happily ate their dinner. My class lecture went well that day. None of my kids forgot their homework, okay, and so forth. Sister Bonnie Parkin in April 2007 General Conference taught this principle, yet the Lord said, thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. All things means just that. Good things, difficult things, not just some things. He has commanded us to be grateful. He knows being grateful will make us happy. This is another evidence of his love. President Monson in October 2010 General Conference further taught, Sincerely giving thanks not only helps us recognize our blessings, but it unlocks the doors of heaven and helps us feel God's love. And I felt God's love. But could I find the happiness as Sister Parkin suggested? Because I remembered to look up and say thank you, Father, each day, I gradually began to find happiness again. And I gained that eternal perspective that I so desperately needed. I am so grateful for these six beautiful lessons that I learned from nature that helped me weather a tumultuous storm in my life and many since that time. There are many more lessons that the natural world has taught me that I didn't have time to share today, but I'm glad I was able to look up and that I found answers and lessons in Heavenly Father's creations. This has made my love of his creations grow even stronger. I feel an urgent desire to help protect and conserve this natural world. President Russell M. Nelson has remarked, as beneficiaries of the divine creation, what shall we do? 
We should care for the earth and be wise stewards over it and preserve it for future generations. Bishop Gerald Casse said in last October's General Conference, the divine gift of the creation does not come without duties and responsibilities. These duties are best described by the concept of stewardship. In gospel terms, the word stewardship designates a sacred, spiritual, or temporal responsibility to take care of something that belongs to God for which we are accountable. We are commanded to care for the Lord's creations and be wise stewards over them because I have benefited so greatly from the divine creation, I truly want to be a good steward over it. Every semester I give a lesson to my students on the importance of this principle. As a result, my students often ask me how they can be good stewards over the earth. What can they do? There is a quote from Brigham Young that I believe provides the answer to that question. It reads, let me love the world as he loves it, to make it beautiful and glorify the name of my Father in heaven. It does not matter whether I or anybody else owns it. If only we work to beautify and make it glorious, it is all right. I pray that we can love the world as he loves it. I have grown to love his creations even more as I have learned these six important lessons. I know if we can truly love the natural world, we will be good stewards over it. I pray that we take the time from our busy, hectic lives to look up and gain perspective that we need. I know the Savior lives, and if we grow toward his light, remain deeply rooted in his living water, rely on the simple basics of the gospel in times of stress, rely on a diverse community around us, and remember that we don't have to have all the answers, and remember to thank him, we will be able to weather any storm in our lives and will gain that eternal perspective. This Easter season, I want you to know that I love my Savior, the Master Healer, and I am so grateful for the blessing of his atonement. And like the primary song, I am glad that I live in this beautiful world that Heavenly Father created for me. I leave you with this testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to gain as saints, to gather as saints and to feel uplifted. We're thankful for Sister Alfin and for her planning and preparation. We're thankful for the spirit that we felt and we're thankful for this beautiful earth that thou has created for us. We ask thee to help us to remember to thank thee for the beautiful creations and to allow them to strengthen our testimonies. And we thank Thee for the opportunity to earn an education at BYU, and please help us to travel safely back to our classes and to our homes, and we love Thee and thank Thee for watching over us, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus devotional. The address today was given by Laureen Alfin. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. Don't miss next week's live devotional address at this same time with Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And download the free BYU Radio app for episodes of the Finding Center podcast, a daily half hour of inspiration and spiritual focus. BYU Devotionals are a production of BYU Broadcasting.